be speaking about the seventh of the seven signs and sayings that we're doing in the first half of John's Gospel. Um, I read through the whole of John's Gospel and three things jumped out at me. Um, a lot of it seemed to be about um, incarnation, grace and truth. So before I talk about what I'm supposed to be talking about, I'm going to wish her a bit about incarnation. <laughs> incarnation is a weird word. It means to take on flesh. And the best way I've met to describe it and explain it is the following, so please bear, please bear with me. Yuri Gagarin was a Soviet pilot and cosmonaut who became the first human to journey into outer space. On the 12th of April, 1961, Gagarin completed one full orbit of the Earth. He was made a hero of the Soviet Union. Khrushchev, the leader of the Soviet Union, used Gagarin's popularity for his own purposes. He said, why are you clinging to God? Here, Gagarin flew up into space and did not see God. This was widely misattributed to Gagarin. Here was something of the sort. But you can't fly off into space and expect to see the creator of the universe sitting, waiting for you in another bit of the same universe. It, Khrushchev's quotation completely misses the point. Now, has anyone heard of a bloke called William Shakespeare? Feel free to take a look at me. <clears throat> Allegedly, his most famous play is Hamlet. Can the character Hamlet, who's a medieval Danish prince, ever understand or get to know William Shakespeare. There's both nothing of Shakespeare and everything of Shakespeare in the play. Every line in every scene that Hamlet comes out with was written by Shakespeare. But they're Hamlet's lines, they're not Shakespeare's thoughts, they're not Shakespeare's actions. For Khrushchev's quotation to make sense, Hamlet would need to be able to walk out of the throne room in Elsinore Castle and find William Shakespeare in 16th century England hiding in the cupboard under the stairs. <laughs> They're on two completely unrelated planes of existence. Mm. Whereas Dorothy L. Sayers wrote detective stories, mostly featuring, featuring the amateur sleuth Lord Peter Whimsey. This Whimsey, like most fictional detectives, was a very lonely figure. In one book, the book Strong Poison, she introduced a leading female character called Harriet Vane, the object of Whimsy's love. Harriet Vane is a literary self-portrait of Dorothy Sayers. Dorothy felt sorry for her character in his lonely state, so she wrote herself into the books. Mm. Harriet Vane doesn't just speak Dorothy's written words. Mm. She comes out with Dorothy's opinions. She acts in the way that Dorothy acted as, if, as a woman the same age. Mm. In knowing Harriet Vane, Whimsy actually gets to know Dorothy Sayers mm. in a way that Hamlet can never know William Shakespeare. Mm. When the word of God became flesh and lived among us, God was writing That's himself into his creation mm. and into human history. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Sorry, that just long. We might not know off the top of our heads the fullness of exactly who God is, mm. but we can discover him by looking at Jesus, because Jesus gives God a human face. Mm. I'm going to, oh sorry, a bit of history. Um, it's understood that the Gospel of John was finished somewhere around about AD 90 or just after, shortly after the daily prayers in every synagogue were changed to detect and formally exclude any Jesus followers who had managed to remain part of synagogue life. For Jewish Christians, this imposed split with the synagogue was a rupture in their family. They were faced with a painful choice. One, confess that everyone's hopeful Messiah is Jesus, be declared heretics, and be forced to leave the community that had nurtured them and given them life. Or two, they could remain in the synagogue, but only by denying what they believed to be true. Mm. The Roman emperor at the time was Domitian. He was a populist tyrant, and a, the persecution of Christians that started under Nero was ramped up in this decade. So the background to the whole of John's Gospel is both an expansion of the church throughout the known world, but also a massive cry of pain at the sudden and repeated misfortunes, mm. as they describe them, that were befalling the church. 
The people that John was writing to needed to be sure of who Jesus is mm. and if following him is really worth it. That's good. Now, the prophetic context. Um, the Hebrew Bible is split into three sections, the law, the prophets, and the writings. The final verse of the law is in, the final verses, rather, of the law are in Deuteronomy chapter 34, mm. verses 10 to 12. Since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, who did all those signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do in Egypt, to Pharaoh and all his officials and the whole land. For no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. I am not going to read the whole of Exodus. If you haven't read it, there are a fair few spectacular signs and wonders that God did through yeah. Moses. The final verse of the prophets are Malachi chapter 4, verses 4 to 6. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. An example, so that, that quote picks out Elijah out of all of the prophets. So I'm going to get, give um, a bit from uh, something Elijah got up to. In 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 17 to 24. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, what do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry. The boy's life returned to him and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, look, your son is alive. The woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God, that the word of the Lord from your mouth is truth. The Hebrew scriptures say a great number of things about the, about the longed for Messiah, but these quotations confirm that the Jews, that the Messiah will perform signs and wonders, will raise the dead, be Moses Mark II, Elijah Mark II. Mm. That's good. Right, uh, now on to um, John chapter 11. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to the Lord, Lord, the one you love is sick. The word love here indicates friendship. The sisters are saying, Lord, your friend is sick. Mm. Their message indicates that the rela their relationship is very close. Mm. Um, actually, the tone kind of reminds me of um, Jesus' mother in, um, in Cana. They just presented Jesus with the facts. Mm -hmm. They didn't actually make a request at all. It's just, these are the facts. Yeah, Deal with Deal it. With it. <laughs> um, so I assume that they expected Jesus to either drop everything and come back to Bethany and heal Lazarus, or, mm -hmm. from a distance, command his healing. Mm -hmm. Reasonable expectation. Verse 4. When Jesus heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death, <laughs> for it is, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. And then he said to disciples, let's go back to Judea. The word for love that Jesus loved 
these family members. Mm -hmm. it's, it's agape. It's a much, much stronger, more profound form of love than just friendship. My RE teacher at school likened it to a parent with a seriously sick child, for example, saying that they would rather go through the operation or the chemotherapy or what have you, rather than watch their child suffer. Mm. That's according to my opinion. <laughs> um, so Jesus profoundly loved all the members of this family. Mm. So why did he hang about for two days mm. and not go back? What do you think he was doing? In John chapter 6, when Jesus was teasing Philip before feeding the 5,000, John said, Jesus knew what he was going to do. Mm. Why did Jesus stay where he was? He knew what he was going to do. And knowing what he, need, what he was going to do, he needed to pray. Yeah. Good. In verse 41, which, yeah, anyway, Jesus thanked God that God had already heard him. So I believe those two day, days were spent in intercession, prayer, submitting to his father will, mm. father's will, rather than rushing to his friend's side. Mm. Verse 7, Jesus said, let's go back to Judah. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you. And you're going back? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they can see by this world's light. But when a person walks at night, then they stumble, for they have no light. Mm. From Jesus' perspective, turning towards Bethany and Jerusalem wasn't just turning towards his friends in need mm. or a spectacular opportunity to demonstrate the glory of God. He was turning towards the culmination of his ministry. Mm his own death mm. and resurrection. Mm. The odd stuff about light and dark echoes what he said in chapter 9, verse 4, before he healed the man born blind. As long as it's day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Right. Night is coming when no one can work. Mm. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Mm. This is an oblique reference to his own death. Mm. But his time hadn't come yet. When Jesus was eventually arrested, arrested rather, it, wa it was at night. Mm. At this point in the story, Jesus was still safe to walk around in broad daylight, teaching and transforming lives. Verse 11, after he said this, he went on, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. Mm. Jesus had been speaking of his death but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Mm. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let's go to him. Then Thomas, known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Mm. <laughs> so Jesus confirms the accusation <coughs> against him. All the accusations are true. Had he gone immediately when summoned, he would have healed Lazarus. But God is good. God's plan is better. Thomas, all too frequently labelled Doubting Thomas, came out with a weird and seemingly random, let us go that we may die with him. Attempts had already been made to stone Jesus. Lazarus is already dead, and Jesus is turning towards his death. Thomas's statement wasn't entirely random. Death was a very real possibility. Thomas shouldn't be called Doubting Thomas. He's Thomas the Brave, <laughs> Courageous Thomas. His statement says that he, st he will stick with Jesus, even in death, mm. rather than outlive him. It's a bit premature, a bit gloomy and morbid, but it's still a declaration of courage and faith. Mm. Verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. This is not how any nice story is supposed to go. Mm. Jesus said, he said that this would not end in death. I mean, how much more dead can you be than buried four <laughs> days ago? <laughs> Jewish people at the time believed in ghosts. It was commonly said that for a couple of days after death, a person's soul would wander around and revisit their body periodically, but that on the third day, it would depart permanently. So in Jewish thinking, Four days dead and buried was utterly dead and totally gone. When Elijah raised a dead boy, he, he hadn't been dead for very long. Anyone thinking that Jesus had the potential to be Elijah Mark II would have given up at this point. Lazarus was longer. Verse 18. 
Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to visit Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Oh, that's amazing. Mm. Being the action woman she was, she went out to meet Jesus, and their conversation is the theological crux of the story. I have no idea <coughs> what she was expecting at this point, but her trust is incredible. Her mm. faith had grown to the point that when faced with completely, a completely insurmountable problem, she still trusted. Verse 23, Jesus said, your brother will rise again. Mm. Martha answered, I know he will rise in the res at the resurrection of the last day. This is standard, Ju standard Jewish theology of the day and the doctrine that Jesus himself came out with in chapter 5. Most Jews believe that God would raise all of his people to life when he finally changed the whole world and established justice and peace for Israel in particular. This was what the resurrection would mean. Verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Martha's already there. The point of John's Gospel is so that people would believe and continue to believe in Jesus. Believe that Jesus is who he says he is. Martha is already there, although her understanding of resurrection was conventional. Verse 28. After she'd said this, she went back and called her sister aside. Sorry, Sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. Mary was absolutely in bits. Jesus had held it together when faced with Martha, but faced with Mary's outpouring of raw emotion at the loss of her brother and Jesus' failure to help, he broke down. John chapter 1 verse 14 says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus demonstrated his humanity. He joined in with their grief. He wept. He was angry. He experienced the normal emotions that anyone would experience when faced with something as devastating as the loss of a really close friend. He might also have been looking at his own death, his own burial, mm -hmm. and the pain that hit this loss would inevitably inflict on all the people standing around him. Verse 37. But some of them said, could he... Could not he, who opened the eyes of the blind man, have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odour. He's been there four days. And Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of the Lord? <coughs> I'm a very literal person. If you say, I'll just be a minute, I'm the one who's counting to 60. <laughs> so when I read, did I not tell you that if you believe you will see the glory of God, I think, nope, <laughs> you haven't said that. I mean, it's close to what you said a few days ago on the other side of the river to a different bunch of people, but not to Martha, you haven't. But 
In Hebrew writing, there's a thing where you say the same thing twice, using different language, to make the fullness of the idea better understood. Mm -hmm. Probably the best known example would be, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is saying the same idea twice in different language. Mm -hmm. So you get a better understanding of the idea. God's kingdom is where his will is done. So for God's kingdom to come here, it would be for God's will to be done here on earth with the, to the same extent, the same thoroughness as it is in heaven. Looking at dictionary definitions of glory, one of them is something that secures praise or renown. The glory of God then can be anything that causes you to praise God. Any divine answer to prayer is the glory of God. Earlier Jesus said, your brother will rise again. Now he said, you will see the glory of God. Different words, same thing. Anyway, Martha gave the nod. Verse 41. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I say this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he'd said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth round his face. And Jesus said, take off the grey clothes and let him go. Jesus, using only the power of his voice, mm. summoned a dead man from the grave who had been buried four days earlier. The entire crowd witnessed Lazarus shuffling out of his own accord and was so stunned that Jesus had to tell people to go and help him. <laughs> Verse 45, therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him, which, let's face it, is the whole point. <laughs> um, I had a look at all seven of the signs. In John chapter 20, verse 30, it says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. John knew he couldn't write down all of the miracles that he performed, miracles that dramatically changed the course of individuals' lives mm. and beautifully demonstrated the power of God. Also, he didn't just write his gospel to ensure that we will be better informed about the life of Jesus. In writing this gospel, John chose which stories the first century church most needed to hear. The seven signs are carefully chosen because they demonstrate dramatically and thoroughly exactly who Jesus is and why we should pay attention to what he says and why we should go on believing in him. The word in John chapter 1 verse 14 it says the word became flesh made his dwelling among us we have seen his glory the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. Jesus is the word through whom all things were made, God in human form, demonstrating the radical fullness of God's grace. What is grace? In Hebrew, it's chesed, loving kindness and mercy. In Greek, it's more like the free and unmerited favor of God, which sound great, fantastic, but what, do they, what does it feel like to encounter the radical fullness of God's grace upon grace in tangible terms? The seven signs from John's Gospel tell us that grace upon grace tastes and smells like an abundant provision of the very best wine. Grace upon grace sounds like the news that your child on death's door has received the all clear and will live. Grace feels like ascending the hill of the Lord, walking into the temple with full range of movement when you've been paralysed for 38 years. Grace feels like a full belly when you left home hours ago with no packed lunch and the nearest Greg's is 2,000 years in the future. <laughs> grace upon grace looks like a bright, colourful world when you were born blind. Grace feels like defying all your knowledge and understanding of how the universe works by balancing securely on the surface of the sea. What does grace sound like? It sounds like when you are deader 
than dead. And you hear your name being called by the Good Shepherd who knows you and loves you. And you can walk out of that tomb fully alive. The other thing I spotted in all seven of them was in the first one, the thing that jumped out was Mary's do whatever he tells you. With each of the seven signs, there is a do whatever he tells you moment. Someone or some people had to do something before the miraculous moment occurred. So what's my takeaway message from all of this? John chapter 20 verse 31 says that these are written that you may believe and go on believing that the Messiah is Jesus, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Believing in Jesus doesn't just mean that God exists, that you believe that God exists, that Jesus was a real person in history who did and said amazing things, that God is trustworthy and genuinely loves us. Christianity is a discovery of the person, Jesus, who is the Son of God and demonstrates the true character of God. Throughout all four Gospels, at every turn, Jesus met pain, alienation, hopelessness with unrelenting love, healing, freedom from guilt and shame. This is who, he, this is who God truly is, love. If you haven't encountered Jesus, Acts chapter 2 verse 38 says, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus. Repent's a weird word. It means to turn, to return or turn fully about. The implication being, turn your life around, turn, return to God. When Peter says repent and be baptized, he means return to God, be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. This is most dramatically done when we first find Jesus, but in all honesty, every time we pray, we are going from our ordinary everyday lives and returning to God. If you already believe in and follow Jesus, do whatever he tells you. That is what it means to follow him. Mm 